Hi, everyone, and thank you for participating in today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar, the ABCs of Tactical Emergency Medical Support. This is part two of the two-part series. Today's instructor is Michael Gorham, a 25-year law enforcement officer who served as a volunteer intermediate technician with a TEMS endorsement and also has a volunteer firefighter background. On the next slide, and before we begin, I want to share with you some information about the Justice Clearinghouse, one of the key reasons why we're all here today. The Justice Clearinghouse is a peer-to-peer -peer educational program for justice professionals launched one year ago. We like to think of the Justice Clearinghouse as a year-round virtual conference in which our audience and members receive timely and relevant information from the field on justice-related topics. While all of our events are free to attend, members receive 24 by 7 access to our entire video library, and they're also eligible to receive certificates of attendance that may be used when seeking continued education credit. So if you're not a present member, I would like to invite you to join today and support our work. And finally, on the next slide, the last thing I want to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and is scheduled to last between 45 and 60 minutes. The webinar will be available on the Justice Clearinghouse website for later viewing. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you could type in any questions you have through the webinar tool. And we'll address as many questions as possible at the conclusion of today's session. And finally, after today's event, we'll go ahead and issue you a post-webinar survey. And we ask that you take a few moments to complete it, as your feedback will help us shape our future calendar of events. So thank you again for attending. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to today's instructor. Michael, it's all yours. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'd really like to encourage you folks to uh, fill out the uh, survey at the end of this, because I actually did spend some time reading over uh, part one, and I'm going to try uh, to address some of the issues from some of the comments. So, so this might be a little bit faster than it was uh, last time. Um, I don't know who might be here the second time that wasn't here the first time. This is my background. You can read it on the screen. I don't want to spend a lot of time going back over this for the majority of the group. Um, the next slide is these are all the folks that helped me out. Um, you know, and uh, I want you to just kind of pay attention right there at the end of the uh, screen from last time. It's Phil Isaacson with Tactical Medic Solutions and stuff. Phil and Brent have been uh, very helpful with me as well. So I'm going to kind of keep going from there. These were a few of the uh, caveats that I explained to the group last time. I don't want to re -re uh, uh, go over that again with you and stuff. or. Uh, I'm trying to speed things up just a little bit so I can get questions answered, hopefully, uh, at the end of this, because I think there's a lot of good synergy that comes from that kind of discussion at the end of training between students and instructors. So hopefully we can get to that. So those were a little bit of the caveats uh, that I had, and then we'll start moving forward. Um, just a quick review from part one. I understood it was really uh, rudimentary and I appreciate the folks in the audience that are advanced paramedics and are like, hey, we've got this, but uh, we're being patient with you. Uh, but I'm teaching at a base level, which you did say that you understood, and I appreciate that. Um, we'll just uh, go through this. Uh, T Triple C is obviously a military origin. Um, and, you know, it was based on a Vietnam database. Um, uh, there's some skewing in some of this that we talked about with the the victims usually being 18 to 35 year old males because that's what the military uh, normally uh, enlists or that's uh, close to the lifetime of uh, service within the military with uh, obviously some exceptions during certain periods in administrative positions. Um, TCCC has no restrictions um, as far as OSHA and the National Registry and uh, VMTs. Uh, and uh, the other um, scopes of practice because it's military and military stands alone, which most of us know here. Uh, tactical emergency casualty care is a civilian adaptation. A lot of the folks that are involved with tactical emergency casualty care or the committee that set this up uh, have a military background and there is some translation. Um, there's a wider population for that. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, differences with tourniquets on pediatric use, whether that's okay and not okay. 
um, there's uh, a different population because we're dealing with uh, a larger group of people, which w that's our civilian population as well. Um, it has to conform somewhat with scopes of practice for uh, pre-hospital care providers that are licensed in their respective states and that uh, it does have to take into consideration for medical oversight. I think the one uh, focus we talked a little bit is uh, needle decompression with uh, tension pneumothorax. Um, that's a paramedic skill for those of you who don't know. Um, but it's not okay for uh, maybe a first responder to do. Um, now, ironically, in my tactical medic courses and stuff, I've been trained four times to do it. I also know it's outside the scope of my practice, and I would probably lose my license uh, if I uh, administered that. Um, so um, there are considerations with some of this. Uh, so that was a review. Um, a lot of common questions when I teach this is what do I need to know um, and uh, we'll kind of cover that briefly. Uh, tactical emergency casualty care should be taught to all law enforcement officers, all EMS providers and uh, fire service and I'll kind of uh, cover that um, in a little bit with the rescue task force and why I, I feel even uh, basic uh, volunteer and uh, and paid fallen uh, firefighters should be trained in it and I'll explain that uh, shortly. The one thing with um, tactical emergency casualty care um, is there really a national standard or curriculum. Number one, it's been a, a evolving topic. It's still relatively new. Um, the National Association of EMTs has some courses that have set they've set up but uh, basically anybody could set up a course and call it tactical emergency casualty care so when you're looking at training in-house and stuff and you're bringing in an outside provider or something you really want to make sure they're following the committee for uh, tactical emergency casualty care provide the curriculum and the guidelines um, if they're not following those guidelines uh, and I, you can do what you want. I'm, I'm not going to say that it's necessarily wrong because I'm not going to be able to speak to that. But when you start deviating from that, now we don't have uniformity. And I think within the next decade, you're going to see uh, a couple groups kind of coming together and trying to develop some sort of uh, guideline, national guidelines on what should be taught. Um, I've uh, participated with a committee for the last year and a half in the state of Wisconsin to set up the guidelines to teach law enforcement officers and that's been a very laborious uh, task because there's a lot of passionate discussion about what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. One of the things that happened in Wisconsin, for, uh, uh, for example, as a lesson for you folks is we had a uh, a teacher who is uh, very, very good at what he does, he was teaching uh, the uh, needle decompression to police officers and he would address the issue of uh, the, the pre-hospital care providers that are licensed that you can't do this but I can teach this to lay people and he found some state statutory language to kind of back that up. He even sought an attorney a general opinion on it and uh, much like I know government and stuff and because of the riskiness involved with it, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, response to that. So that got a little dicey. So, um, you know, once again, this just demonstrates how new this is and uh, uh, some of the pitfalls along the way because uh, as much as the law enforcement uh, uh, folks in the house are out there and they're passionate about how to approach the job. EMS providers and fire uh, service uh, providers are equally as passionate about their views on s stuff as well. So moving on, um, just some things I wanted to share with you. The NTOA, the National Tactical Officers Association, has a STORM course. That's one of the courses that I attended. It's the Specialized Tactics for Operational Medicine. There might be some issues, and it might not be called STORM anymore, but uh, the NTOA at its annual conference every year uh, usually puts on some sort of uh, tactical medic course, and you have to be an EMT level, uh, a basic EMT or above to attend the course. 
Um, it's a very, very good course. It's taught by Tier 1 operators and uh, a variety of other folks uh, uh, across the uh, nation and whatnot. Uh, from uh, Mark Gibbons from uh, Maryland State Patrol has been involved in that. Um, CONTOMS is another uh, a course. Uh, I'm not sure what the status is. I was understanding that it was uh, being brought back up. One of the two things of these two courses that I'll share with you that I've learned, CONTOMS focuses more on a little bit medical interventions is what I'm taught. And then uh, uh, the STORM course was a little bit about the rescues itself, the extrication of uh, folks outside the uh, warm zone and whatnot. So um, the National Association of EMTs, like I said before, has uh, classes, a, a TCCC class and a TE, or Tactical Emergency Casualty Care uh, course as well. Um, and they follow the curriculum as set forth by the committee uh, and those are both very good courses uh, and the instructors are vetted. Um, Wisconsin and my home state has a variety of in-house courses that have been developed uh, so if you're in somewhere in the Midwest and uh, there's you get into our tactical uh, our, our technical college system and stuff there's a uh, website called WileyNet and you can look for courses on uh, tactical emergency medicine um, and I know Waukesha Technical College and uh, I believe North Central Technical College right now are kind of the leaders in that uh, area as well as uh, I think Southwest Tech and where my area along the state of Iowa is starting to break into that barrier as well. So uh, all I'm going to suggest is that you know when you're approaching vendors that you're uh, asking questions and stuff you want to check the medical backgrounds uh, of the instructors and stuff and make sure what you're buying. The old uh, uh, Latin phase uh, that uh, buyer beware is what I'm going to recommend to you so you're not wasting time and money uh, with regards to this or uh, people are taught wrong interventions and, and whatnot. So I get asked a lot what's the basic equipment. Uh, I think that was one of the things that Aaron shared with me from the last uh, 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 part one and I'll just kind of go through uh, basic equipment is a tourniquet, a chest seal, a 28 French nasal airway. Uh, the 28 French is a size uh, as far as nasal airways go. Um, it fits about 90 percent of the population and so uh, because of that uh, they recommend when I went to the storm course they were like 28 French and that seems to be the literature across the board the 28 French if you're going to have a nasal airway and it's not that intrusive to insert and stuff uh, that's the nasal airway to uh, to have with you. Gauze. Now here with the issue of gauze there's regular gauze and then there's hemostatic gauze. Uh, when I first went to the storm course one of the things that I had with me was the granules of hemostatic uh, powder and that caused a bunch of uh, problems. There was some medical research on that, that it caused thrombosis. Um, what would happen is the um, particles, the kaolin, that would help with the clotting would then start to travel within the blood system itself and there are some very small veins and uh, whatnot in which clotting would start to occur and then that would cause uh, the thrombosis which basically uh, would lead to, uh, you know, clotting of the artery and then you know potentially rupture uh, in that case. Uh, that's kind of been changed somewhat now. Uh, the hemostatic agents have been put in with uh, the gauze. They're a little bit more expensive and they have a shelf life but uh, if uh, it's still packaged up in its uh, airtight sealed package um, you know, you're going to have to depend on what your distance is to a particular hospital. Uh, you know, whether or not you get standard gauze or whether or not you get uh, the uh, uh, hemostatic agents. And there's a variety of uh, quick clot comes to mind. And uh, I think Celux has another uh, hemostatic gauze as well, you know, and it's just a matter of your preferences. A trauma bandage sometimes is referred to as like an Israeli trauma bandage or an emergency trauma bandage. Um, one of the things with that is that that's to help wrap and 
provide compression once you put gauze in a particular wound, so that would be needed. Uh, trauma shears uh, to be able to cut away clothing and stuff and be able to assess uh, your wounds and whatnot. And obviously, um, it might not seem like a lot to, uh, to some of our law enforcement folks in the house, but anybody that works in pre-hospital care knows that any time that uh, uh, you're putting your hands on somebody and there's an open cut, there's always the possibility of an infection and that could complicate things. So uh, it's always a good idea for a lot of different reasons to have uh, gloves with you and to make sure they're um, for the environment that we work in is that they are a, a glove that's got good tensile strength to it that's not going to tear very easily. So continuing on from there, uh, this is the next thing that uh, comes up uh, is the tourniquets. I have guys on my department that came up and they're like, hey, I've got a SWAT T and I know it's being marketed as a tourniquet. I'm not saying that it couldn't uh, be effective in some manner. What I'm going to suggest to you is that uh, based on evidence-based medicine from the United States military who studied this and the efficacy, these are the two recommended tourniquets. This is the soft T tourniquet made by Tactical Medic Solutions and the other one is the uh, combat action tourniquet or the CAT made by North American Rescue. They're both very good uh, tourniquets. Um, I was a little bit more familiar with the CAT because that's what I initially I was trained on, but the soft T is equally as good. It lays flat. Um, it can be put into a pouch uh, underneath like soft body armor. Um, Tactical Medic Solutions has a holder that actually attaches to like soft body armor and it lays a little bit flatter. The CAT has these little uh, hooks on the sides that clip in the windlass, that nomenclature for that particular, uh, what you would layman's terms call a stick, is referred to as the windlass. And uh, what it does is it provides the mechanical compression to uh, clamp off uh, uh, any kind of bleeding by putting in, uh, pressure on uh, an artery. And we'll cover that in a little bit here. But these are the two recommended tourniquets by the United States military. Their efficacy is like 98.9%. Uh, it's very, very high. Um, some of the other tourniquets uh, that are uh, commercially available uh, that they looked at, there's a study on this. Um, the efficacy goes down quite a bit. Um, what I told my guys, and this is my personal opinion, was the SWAT team makes a very good pressure bandage um, and that it might make uh, the good basis for an improvised tourniquet as long as you could find some sort of a stick uh, to create that windlass, that compression and whatnot. But then this is the other part with public service is we're all told to work with what we got. So if you can't afford these two tourniquets for whatever reason and your agency bought uh, a different tourniquet, understand what its limitations are and try to work around that as best as you can. We all face uh, those issues from time to time where the powers that be that control the purse string say you're going to just have to work with what you got. So, uh, but I highly recommend either, this is like your preference, Ford versus Chevy, it's, they're, they're, these are both very, very good tourniquets, um, and uh, these are the two that are recommended by the military. Um, as far as individual kits, I'll go through a couple things here with you. On the left side of your screen, you're going to see uh, an individual kit, and it's packaged, I'll show you how it's packaged for me. Uh, in my squad in a minute. Um, what I have is the chest seal. It's a high fin chest seal. It's a little bit uh, heavy on the North American Rescue products. There's an emergency trauma bandage and then I have just straight gauze. Uh, part of the reason that was is because I actually uh, bought a majority of our medical kits for our, uh, uh, our deputies and whatnot. We have a very small department but uh, I wanted to make sure they had the equipment so I could only afford regular gauze. 
Um, and then there's the uh, that clear tube is a 28 nasal French airway. Uh, beyond that is a Coleman emergency blank uh, blanket, and I'll cover that in a second. And then there is the um, um, tourniquet, and it's in orange. Uh, whether you want it in orange or black is uh, really up to you. I like orange so then people can see it because uh, I don't know that we need to have our tourniquets concealed. Uh, sometimes that's a benefit and sometimes it's not. Uh, I have an emergency trauma blanket because when people start to have a significant hemorrhage, uh, hypothermia becomes an issue. And without getting into that becomes kind of an advanced course all by itself, and the paramedics in the room will understand that. But I think it's a good idea to have some sort of a, a blanket to be able to cover your casualty. And the other thing I was taught by a Pima County uh, medic was is that if you're providing medical care, talk to your casualty, even if the casualty doesn't seem to be conscious. A reassuring voice uh, is very, very helpful. You know, and I, from my years of experience running in the back of a rig in an ambulance, uh, I, I found that uh, it really does pay a lot of uh, dividends to, you know, keep talking to your patient, uh, you know, and not uh, get so involved with the interventions that you kind of neglect that you're still working with a person and stuff. And they're in an ang there's a lot of anxiety there uh, for them, obviously, so they, you know, help to work to reassure them. Uh, the one thing that you won't see in this uh, is, is that I have a set of trauma shears. This all gets wrapped up in a small kit, and I'll show you where that is in a minute. Um, this is my medic kit for an active shooter event. If I had to go in and I was a medical service provider, um, I have a set of binoculars for remote assessment. I work in a rural area that is a lensatic compass. It's a military uh, compass. Uh, those are some extra magazines that you see there. My um, uh, my uh, trauma shears. There's uh, hemostatic gauze at the top with a bag of gloves. That long black uh, belt-looking thing is actually a soft tea tourniquet. I basically laid this out on my floor and took a picture of it. Um, I'm sorry, uh, it, I don't have that level of professional graphics to make it more commercial-looking, but. Uh, it does give you a sense of what all I have, and then I just have more of everything. Uh, there's uh, the hyphen chest seals, uh, more nasal airways. These are caliumine sticks. Um, I like uh, using those for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, it provides lighting. If you're doing any kind of night operations at night and you're having to move through woods, it's a way to be able to keep track of your partners. Um, in an active shooter event, if you're trying to mark maybe certain places where you've been, you can break out the calamine stick and drop that. So there's that. And then these are uh, more emergency trauma bandages, more gauze here. That's a mirror. Uh, that comes from the tactical side of the house of being able to look around the corner and maybe being able to see. So, um, And then the other part that I missed was the... Uh, duct tape or military grade 100 mile an hour tape right next to the uh, flashlight. I'm sorry if the pictures are kind of small and it might be kind of hard for you to see, but I'll be more than happy to kind of uh, provide any information for you at the end of the uh, um, presentation. Bags. Um, I'm kind of a gadget guy, so I uh, worked with some different bags. Um, the bag that I have uh, my uh, individual stuff in is made by Condor. It's this red bag right here. That's the right side of the picture. It's a small bag. You'll see that it's got a Velcro backing to it. And one of the nice parts about that is that it has the other uh, 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 part of the Velcro has Molly straps to it, so I can strap it to my uh, chest plate uh, and basically uh, carry it with me like that as well. Um, there is a small um, bag right next to it that basically drops down. It's a drop-down leg holster kind of bag. Um, I work ATV patrol, so uh, there are times when I'll strap that on, but I don't. That's a different set of equipment because I'm looking at different medical problems for that. The uh, brown uh, uh, pouch is uh, made by 511, and. Uh, 
the uh, 511 pouches, what I do is I store a lot of rescue equipment on that and it actually gets uh, put onto this bigger bag here. Uh, that's the one with the little, um, that's in honor of Michael Murphy and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into that with you right now because we have important things to go through. But this is my active shooter medic bag. This is where I carry all my stuff and then I attach this brown bag to the outside of it with uh, carabiners and chest uh, 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 various straps, rescue uh, straps and, and it's basically a tech tape. We'll cover that in a minute. The bag next to it is the LAPD uh, or I'm sorry the LA uh, police gear bag for 1999 uh, that they sell. Uh, our department bought ones for each of the squad cars and that was my first original bag. Um, and going where I put the kits. Uh, now we have take home squad cars so what I do is for my individual kit um, it's velcro to the uh, cage of the squad car and I took this in red light and I've got a, a little red cross on it so you can see that uh, even in low light situations that is very easy to uh, see right underneath it is my flashlight and that's just a board that the flashlight charger is attached to but it sits right in between the seats so if well, I have any kind of a situation immediately I can grab that kit right away. Um, what I recommend for my other guys is that this is the LA police gear uh, bag and basically and it, I, we just happen to have that bag. Their Condor makes a bag like this, uh, uh, 511 makes a bag like this, they're all good bags, it's just your preference what you would like. But my recommendation is that if you're going to have an active shooter or goal bag that it sits somewhere up front and then you put your medical stuff in it so then it can be easily accessed and, and sitting on the floor. So hopefully, you know, that gives you guys some ideas as far as where to put kits and whatnot. And, um, you know, the other things that I just, you know, I've said before is just be cautious about, you know, they're a hot topic right now and people who are involved in business are interested in selling you stuff. And sometimes the people that sell you stuff don't have a very strong background in it. So, you know, my recommendation is do your research. Um, you have my email address and stuff at the end of this. If you have any questions, say, hey, Mike, I've got a question about this. What do you think about this? You know, I've spent an awful lot of money over the years because uh, I'm one of those guys that experiments with stuff. And so I'm always trying to build a better mousetrap. And so, you know, you could probably learn from my research, which then is not going to cost you or your agency a lot of money, hopefully. Um, the other things that I normally have with uh, my kits is uh, I do have a SOG axe. Uh, uh, it's a small little one, uh, you know, for any kind of breaching. I also carry a Halligan tool uh, in the back of my squad. Um, and then there's tech tape, which for the firefighters in the house are going to understand this because a lot of uh, uh, firefighters will have tech tape and that's really what it is, is it a one inch to an inch and a half tape and you basically use it as straps to uh, do extrications with uh, folks as far as trying to drag them out of uh, uh, harm's way and whatnot, whether you're in a fire or whether you're in the middle of a fire fight, this, there, um, there are tools to be able to use that with, uh, so hopefully that kind of helps you out. I thought I had a picture of that, I'm sorry I didn't. Um, once again, these are just some caveats, you know, and then it's about sustainability, you know, how easy is it, you know, that all, even the tourniquets have a shelf life to them. Um, for the most part, our environment is not as austere as what it might be in Iraq or Afghanistan where sand is kind of withering away at the, the uh, material every day. Um, one of the things that I am going to re recommend though is that you, you kind of saw with the one tourniquet, it was still in its plastic wrapper. Uh, get them out of their plastic wrapper, get them uh, folded. There's videos from North American Rescue and uh, Tactical Medic Solutions on how to load the uh, uh, tourniquets and get them prepared and uh, you know make sure they're ready to go like that so you can just basically pull it out and if you needed to do self-aid you could. 
Um, you know, and these are probably rhetorical questions, you know, as far as, you know, your, your vendors and make sure that, uh, once again, I'm suggesting that your stuff is vented by the military or uh, any other possible, um, uh, uh, any other uh, legitimate body like the National Association of EMTs or the American College of Emergency Physicians. So there's some sort of vetting process to the equipment that you're buying and whatnot. So um, I'm going to jump back a little bit uh, and talk about trauma a little bit. I'm just going kind of back through all of this. Um, that last section was inserted for your folks' benefit. I hope it was beneficial to you. Um, actually, this is kind of where I started. Um, this is a drill that we're doing the picture and it's basically, uh, I'll cover that in a minute as far as doing extrications uh, out of the hot zone or the warm zone and using a vehicle as a platform. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, most of you have all heard about uh, the platinum five minutes or the golden hour. The golden hour usually refers to once we get to uncompensated shock uh, that the, the outcome of the patient is not going to be good. Uh, what happens in the first five minutes will often dictate the uh, the outcome of the patient and stuff. So it's really important as soon as we're able to start providing care that it's quality care and the interventions are the right interventions. And so, um, you know, I want you to go back and think about last uh, time when we were talking about what was the average response time for police. And now we're, you know, we're in a very time competitive event when we have uh, any kind of trauma caused uh, by uh, penetrating trauma caused by bullets or bombs or, or anything like that or even uh, like edged weapons and stuff. So, so um, when you're talking about training and, and whatnot, one of the things that, you know, I work on with our department is trying to go through, okay, um, uh, sometimes you'll see this acronym, um, I believe it was originally from the military, but it even has benefit here now, is an assessment, sometimes it's this situational size up. Uh, I know the fire service spends an awful lot of time, hey, let's, we're going to size things up before we go at it and stuff. And when you read a lot about special operations work and stuff, you want to move at a fast where you're a pace where you're cautious, but you're not moving so fast that you actually create more havoc and stuff. That it's a very controlled uh, situation. So you want to do a, 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 you know, a rapid assessment of the situation. You know, look for uh, hemorrhaging from extremities. That's the number one thing uh, to deal with. And then you're going to uh, work on circulation, airway, breathing, and evacuation. And Basically, uh, these are situations where we're in the warm uh, zone, uh, not in the hot zone. In the hot zone, basically, you're going to make sure that the threat has been neutralized and that uh, uh, the other two issues is that you really can do is just get people off the X, the X referring to where the firefight is occurring. If they need to get a tourniquet on them, if they can do it themselves, that's optimal. If they can roll behind cover, that's optimal. If they're down and they're completely down and they're unconscious or barely conscious and you need to drag them, then you need to look at the only other thing you can really do in hot zone medicine is really uh, place people in a recovery position, which is laying them on basically their left side. And that's for the medical providers in the house that's so the tongue doesn't end up uh, uh, falling back and then blocking the airway and stuff. And that's what the nasal airway is designed to do. So, and I'll, I'll kind of cover that in a little bit here. So moving on, uh, these are the modality acronyms that I've uh, been taught throughout the training that I have attended to. And so <clears throat> when you're evaluating training, uh, these are things that you might want to look for is you'll either hear threat and that's because uh, in government we all love our acronyms and stuff and one day I'd like to have a job just coming up with really cool acronyms I guess. Um, hopefully that was a funny joke for the rest of you too. But um, 
Anyway, threat is threat suppression, hemorrhage control, rapid evacuation, assessment, and transport. And these are the these are the modalities that you really want to be trying to drive into your uh, people when you're um, uh, teaching and whatnot. Uh, and then the other one might be March. Uh, I know the National Association of EMTs and their training uses this quite a bit. We've adopted it in Wisconsin. Is you address massive bleeding first, then you deal with the airway, then you deal with respirations, other circulation, and then hypothermia, and then once again head out or evacuation and stuff. So if you're evaluating training and you're looking through any kind of uh, like manuals or anything like that about what are you going to if you're an uh, outsourced vendor. You want to make sure that uh, these are uh, uh, included in because this is these are very very common within um, this environment and stuff. Uh, a lot of people will already in the audience probably already know about this. Um, just to give you some uh, other ideas as far as hemorrhaging goes and, and why this is a time competitive event um, and why we need to teach police and fire and. And I, you know, ideally, if we can even teach uh, office staff and teachers some of this stuff, that's ideal as well. Is that death from a hemorrhage can occur within one to three minutes? Uh, compromised airway is four to five minutes. Uh, attention, no more th th thorax. Usually uh, takes. Uh, 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 it starts at about 10 minutes and then uh, it might be upwards a little bit closer towards the 60 uh, minute mark and then you'll start to see jugular vein uh, distension which is late signs of tension pneumothorax. That's where the lung is collapsed and basically uh, air is filling into the thoracic cavity and compressing uh, the pressure against the heart and then the heart has trouble breathing or sorry, beating, I apologize about that. Um, and so basically what happens then is that, uh, uh, you know, you, you're going to have your patient basically die and stuff. But what you need to do is understand uh, how to deal with that and how to uh, do an assessment and understand, okay, all right, if he's bleeding out on the arm, then we need to address that first and then we're going to deal with the uh, uh, penetration to the thoracic cavity next. You, you, don't, you always have to deal with uh, uncontrolled bleeding first. So. Um, once again, this kind of is a visualization for the uh, people who are maybe not medical providers in the house. This is kind of what your normal blood volume looks like on the left side with the five liters of uh, red liquid in these bottles. Um, and on the uh, left side, what you'll see as blood starts to uh, drain out, there's different stages and signs and symptoms as we get towards uh, different levels. The body is going to start trying to compensate for the loss of blood. And what usually will happen is you'll get vasoconstriction. Um, anytime we're under a stressful event, that's uh, back from our dinosaur days where the, uh, the veins and everything tighten up and we kind of go into battle mode and it's designed to prevent bleeding. A lot of times you'll see somebody that all of a sudden there's no bleeding during the event and then all of a sudden when things become calm, you go from vasoconstriction to vasodilation and then all of a sudden they start bleeding out quite a bit. And right about uh, a liter and a half to two liters, you're going to start uh, in this time frame on the second bottle, you're going to start to see an altered mental status because blood is going to leave the forebrain and it's going to go to the midbrain. It's the way the body uh, responds to these uh, types of uh, you know, um, stressors. And so you need to be aware of the signs and symptoms as each uh, uh, each uh, point goes and once you get to about uh, two and a half liters if you don't have somebody uh, pretty much either with an infusion of blood or plasma of some sort uh, you know more than likely you're in, at this stage you're in uncompensated shock and death is going to be probable which is you know, obviously a tragedy and stuff so um, one of the other things uh, that I spent a lot of time that was taught to me, and I, you, I, 
you kind of see this in different forms and stuff. Uh, when you're dealing with law enforcement officers, if they've been involved in the firefight and they've gotten shot and they're bleeding profusely and you start to notice that altered mental status, you need to check them for weapons and stuff. And usually you'd like to think that people have addressed this issue that the other law enforcement officers have like, okay, um, you know, I've done this, but uh, I've taken care of making sure that he's sterile of weapons. But there are times uh, under stress that we're so focused on the event that we forget about little things. And uh, during training events, I've seen officers come out that, you know, were mimicking an altered mental status as part of the training evolution. And what happened was is that they were, um, uh, they still had a weapon on them and that could be hazardous in the back of a rig or something like that. So uh, make sure that if you, they're developing an altered mental status that you're going to have to uh, sterilize them of weapons. And that's something that should be worked out between fire or police and EMS ahead of time. So. Um, once again, uh, this is a video when I gave you a warning about the graphicness. This is a graphic from um, Iraq, uh, an IED, uh, the soldier uh, survived and stuff. But uh, this is just showing, you know, the extent of thinking about how quickly somebody was going to bleed out. And this is really before the tourniquets uh, were deployed to the troops. And so uh, in this particular case, if my memory serves me, these were rangers. And what they did was they used cravats, and basically those are logs. And they used that to do, they understood the principle of the tourniquet. And so basically from that point forward, you know, we need to get that uh, clamp down because he's going to obviously bleed out and perish. So this shows you your tension pneumothorax to give you a little bit better understanding of it. I know the medical providers in the uh, room might understand this a little bit better, but it's designed to at least visualize things a little bit for the law enforcement officers who might not have subsequent uh, medical training. So, And then um, this is an airway, um, if I remember right, uh, uh, this was an Iraqi or an ally soldier. I think he was hit with the AK-47 round, and um, that we're talking about airways. Now, this is a, a very graphic, and I apologize about that, but this was a survivable wound. He is, he is not out of, of uh, the fight referring to his life, um, but you're going to have to think about some stuff. If you're doing patient movement with this particular individual and stuff, the tripod position is going to be better so that drainage comes out uh, uh, over top of him rather than down the back of his throat. And uh, I was instructed by my instructors that this gentleman actually survived the uh, the tr or the uh, event and stuff. So, all right. When um, I learned this from uh, Chad Stiles, who I want to give the credit to, Chad is one of the leaders in Wisconsin as far as developing tactical emergency casualty care. And he taught me about uh, PACE mythology and medical interventions. And if you're going to train, um, you know, you see this with pilots and whatnot, uh, is that, hey, look, um, we're going to have a problem, so we're going to move to an uh, uh, alternate strategy, or we're going to have a contingency strategy, or an emergency strategy. So, like in the event of uh, massive hemorrhaging, your emergency is direct pressure uh, just by putting your uh, glove uh, down on the wound and maybe leaning on top of it. Uh, contingency might be, okay, I've got a belt and I can find some sort of a stick and I'm going to try that. And we did some practice with some of that stuff. And the, the, the leather belts don't seem to work quite as well as some of the other belts. Um, I have a rigger's belt that I normally wear while I'm on duty, and there's a little bit of a problem with the rigger's belt when it comes to being a contingency for, a, you know, a, a, like in, in the a tourniquet, because that the buckle that I have on my Blackhawk belt doesn't allow for it to compress like a normal, uh, 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 like a 511 belt or some of the military belts where you can really uh, compress that down because I've got that uh, triangular buckle on it. 
So when you're talking about uh, setting up training and stuff, you want uh, not only to teach them about how to use a tourniquet or uh, chest seals, but you're also going to want to teach them like layers. If you don't have this, then you can go to this. Like one of the things that uh, if you were a, a, a caught in a mall and you don't have your medical kit with you or for whatever reason, but there's an AED and a guy's got a, a, a sucking chest wound, cut the pads off the AED and, and slap that pad down uh, because that's going to work as like an inclusive dressing. Uh, if I was in a school and I was teaching teachers, I'm like, do you have saran wrap and do you have tape? Um, you know, that's the things that you want to teach them, not only like the techniques and the tools, but also train them the big broad strokes of what is trying to be accomplished by the intervention. So then in try and teach them to use uh, uh, cont uh, alternates and, and layers of if you don't have this, if you don't have this, uh, uh, then try and go to this. And you can, you know, do that with a variety of different medical interventions. So um, I've, I've kind of answered some questions hopefully about medical kits and a little bit uh, uh, backside of the trauma revisited again. Um, now I want to talk to you about uh, the rescue task force concept. Um, basically this is a, a concept that originally I, it was um, sent to me by John Hallbrook from uh, the state of Iowa who got it from Arlington, uh, Virginia. Uh, uh, their fire department uh, had started coming up with the idea of, hey, let's try and get uh, people in there as quickly as possible to help with definitive care. I want you to think back to like the 1997 uh, North Hollywood shootings in uh, California. Bad guy goes down. Uh, what happens is is that the LA fire paramedics sit on the perimeter and they're waiting. Uh, the SWAT guys from LAPD are like, we don't know if we have a secure environment, so bad guy bleeds out. And there's probably not going to be a lot of sympathy for the bad guy in that particular case. But now we got to start looking at, all right, what about if that's a victim? If that's your mother or your daughter or your father or your brother or whatnot, uh, people are going to be hot. If or are very upset if they don't uh, feel that we've done everything possible to uh, get uh, them to definitive care. So um, this started originating of, well, let's start working together. And the idea of task forces and joint public safety operations has lineage back into the military. And so that's where we're going to start first. However, in any of these events, and the Rescue Task Force is really designed around an active shooter event, the first thing we're going to worry about is we're stopping the threat. We're not going to have any more casualties, so that's number one. And good medicine might end up being bad tactics because we don't want to start working on doing CPR on the X when bullets are flying around us and stuff. And some difficult decisions might have to be made during these events. So. Since uh, Columbine, uh, that was the first time that the police uh, basically had to change the way they uh, thought and basically what happened was is we stood outside and waited for SWAT and then it became a killing field inside for the two other individuals, uh, the two suspects. And so after Columbine, there became this paradigm shift of the active shooter response or active killer response. Um, Within a couple other of these events, uh, fire and EMS agencies have sat on the outside of the scene because you are all tra trained uh, going back to we can't come in until you tell us the scene is safe. Well, we're going to have to start uh, moving away from that paradigm. So um, what we're looking at is not is the scene safe, is the scene safer. And the whole issue is you know, that the injured are not receiving that treatment and are dying from their wounds. Um, and, you know, that's not acceptable because we all have a fundamental responsibility to address the issue of um, the issue of preservation of life. And um, so moving on from that, okay, I, and I want to clarify this. This gets confusing with people. 
is that TAMS is uh, tactical emergency medical support for the SWAT team. The rescue SWAT task force is a combined resources of the public safety team uh, that mitigates, uh, you know, the mass casualty event, but it's still a law enforcement driven event. Both use tactical emergency casualty care. Uh, once again, these are fire and EMS goals, uh, and just notice now that I'm running a little bit late on time, so I'm going to try and speed stuff up a little bit. Um, so these are the goals, uh, and one of the things like with Milwaukee Fire, they started uh, addressing the issue of like, look, if we put you in the proper uh, uh, gear and we provide you training, this is no different than any other hazardous event. So. And that's the reality. Okay, and this is some of what they were talking about as far as developing uh, equipment. And this comes from Arlington Fire. Basically, this is a plate carrier, and uh, instead of uh, carrying weaponry and stuff, and that becomes an entirely um, uh, medics in a SWAT team being armed and. Uh, not armed is another discussion and that depends a lot upon local jurisdiction and issues like that. Traditionally when uh, what happens with uh, the rescue task force is EMS or fire rescue uh, folks are being escorted in. They're not armed. They have equipment on them and they're also, you cannot expect people to go into these events without at least protection and that's basically plate carriers and helmets. Uh, this is what they carry as far as equipment in Arlington, tourniquets times two, uh, pressure bandages, or the, that's those uh, trauma bandages. Uh, they have paramedics, so you're going to see that 14-gauge needle. And then Tegaderm is the clear plastic tape used like for um, IVs and stuff like that. And uh, that's what they have as far as equipment. So I kind of... Uh, uh, covered that uh, twice now. So, but here's the rescue task force idea. Okay, we're going to take two cops and we're going to take two medics. Now, where I work, I work with a lot of volunteers, uh, EMS and fire. So one of the things that I started uh, paying attention to is that it's firefighters that do a lot of the moving, and so maybe we're going to have to look at trying to incorporate a firefighter with uh, an. Uh, uh, an emergency medical technician and you know your resources are going to have to be kind of dependent upon what you have in your particular uh, jurisdiction and stuff but th their idea was to come up with two police officers and two medics and this is a full, this is a paid uh, agency with both these and the officers then again they they provide the security and the medics come in and then they begin the evacuation of the wounded this all occurs in the warm zone and if this is an active shooter event, the V's represent victims, and there's a shooter, um, and here comes our uh, uh, law enforcement officers. They're represented by the contact team. Their only responsibility right now is to terminate that threat. Either uh, that guy gives up or else he's terminated, and they're moving. The police officers at this stage are taught to move past wounded to deal with uh, the suspect, which is even now it's still difficult because it's difficult to have somebody move past the wounded person but you, they have to focus on terminating that threat. So then once the contact team has uh, neutralized the threat but the scene is still somewhat unstable because we don't know if there's a second shooter, now we're going to try and stabilize stuff and now we're going to bring in a, our first team on the rescue task force. Now this situation, this uh, these medics could be doing triage, determining who can walk out of here, who can be, a, you know, who has to be carried out, or basically um, who is uh, 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 non-responsive and is probably not going to make it, and we're going to you know, work on triage. And then, okay, so I covered that with the triage, and then I'll come back here. Here's our second team from the rescue task force. And now they begin the extrication of victims out of the warm zone uh, to definitive care. And then once the, uh, that starts and the scene is more secure, then more rescue task force people can come in and then pull 
stuff uh, uh, pull people out of the warm zone that need care. Um, <laughs> this is very dynamic and you can start off small and you can work on one victim in maybe like a residence and trying to work and, and build this because this is going to be a, a, a crawl, walk and run type of uh, uh, event for your particular jurisdictions because um, a lot of law enforcement agencies that I work with are very leery about having uh, volunteers enter into a warm zone because this is a new concept. Um, there's a lot of, uh, okay, uh, it's a crime scene. Uh, we don't want to expose people. Liability comes up. Uh, you know, they're, they're, at times police and fire and EMS play really well together and at other times things don't go so well. And usually when things don't go so well is when we haven't sat at the table and talked about stuff um, ahead of time. So, you know, here's some stuff you can read on the uh, on the PowerPoint and stuff. Um, like I said, with the rural areas, looking at your volunteer firefighters, training them in the basic concepts of tactical emergency casualty care and, and maybe even triaging and stuff and using them as litter bearers. And then, you know, the other things is learning to set up casualty collection points and, you know, trying to walk through this. And it, it's going to be a uh, slow process. I started working on this project back in 2007 in my area, and it's now 2015. We've made some significant strides, but we still have a very long way to go because you have to get all the stakeholders on board. So... Other things that I just want to go through with you a little bit was uh, breaching. Make sure that uh, I, you know uh, that might be an issue as far as trying to get people out of situations. This was when I was at the NTOA. Um, once again, here are some other things. I'm going to show you something as far as in Wisconsin, a lot of the uh, uh, officers and, and whatnot are big fellas that look like they play football. So one of the things that I started... Uh, to work on is this is the back end of our squad cars uh, and that basically we're going to start learning to use the back ends as platforms for moving uh, uh, officers or victims out of the warm zone if uh, ambulances are a distance because dragging people that are 250 to 300 pounds any length or distance is uh, extremely exhausting even for the most physically fit. Now, one of the things that I want to share with you about vehicle platforms when we did our training, and this is me showing uh, these techniques to our uh, deputies and our officers in our area and, uh, and using the back end of the squad as a platform to move somebody, is that if the driver takes off too quickly and that hatch is open, uh, there's a, a possibility that if there's a medic or somebody in back, they could fall out. We did have a little mishap with that. Nobody was hurt, uh, thank God. But I want to share that with you. So if you look at this and say, hey, that's not a bad idea. Uh, these ideas were originally taken away from some of the contractors that had been working over in Iraq. Uh, I wanted to share that with you and stuff. So uh, real quick, uh, these are just some ideas that I wanted to pass along to you guys as far as you know, be scholars, think about stuff, you know, uh, who, what your jurisdiction is, understand that uh, it's time competitive and it's sometimes resource challenge. Always build relationships, always network. I, I can't stress in my career how important that's been. Um, once again, uh, just about leadership, if you're a part of the team, work on big, broad strategies. Uh, not necessarily uh, specifics because at the first uh, uh, contact, a lot of times that stuff goes right out the door. And uh, one of the things uh, that I want to show you, I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. I do talk to this about the EMS providers. I've been to some situations where there's been shootings. Um, and the EMS people, there's a suspension of disbelief. It's, there's a different mindset when you go into a motor vehicle accident versus going into an incident where somebody has been maimed or killed by violence. And there's kind of a, a slow pause. So you need to kind of prepare your fire and your EMS people uh, like, hey, that's not going to, uh, that's not unusual for you to have that, but you just train, you uh, be forewarned about it, and then you work through it. And then I give... Uh, 
two books uh, here. Dave Grossman's book, uh, he's a friend of mine, uh, On Combat, and he wrote On Killing, he's wrote in some other books, and he writes a lot of forwards. Uh, very good book, and uh, Gavin DeBecker, The Gift of Fear, um, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from my fire and EMS people about these two books. Now, as far as other resources, real quickly, I just want to kind of go down and show you these. I've kind of talked about them during my entire uh, presentation, hopefully. So hopefully that helps you out. And um, when people ask me, these are my books that I've studied out of. That was my storm operator book. Uh, I find this tactical medicine essential book very good. Uh, this came from the National Association for EMTs at pre-hospital trauma uh, care. And then uh, these are my military books, uh, really good. The Ranger Medic book and uh, uh, Special Forces Medic uh, Manual helped me out a little bit understanding stuff. This is also another good book, too, with a lot of uh, good interventions. It's a little bit closer to the paramedic level. So I thank you for sharing the last two hours with me. Uh, Heather, do we have time for any questions, or have I pretty much gone to the limit? Oh. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if you were there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. We actually um, we did not receive any questions during today's session. However, thank you so much for providing all of this information and your contact information for the attendees to follow up with you. Do you have any closing remarks for folks, especially regarding the networking um, between the disciplines? Well, um, I've, uh, I've been doing this uh, uh, since 89, and unfortunately I've been at some situations where we didn't uh, plan, the event just came upon us, and I saw fights and arguments uh, occur, and that usually leads to some problems uh, down the road. And, stuff. and then I've seen where we've worked really well together, so I, I'm very big on trying uh, to explain to my law enforcement partners how fire and the AMS people think, and then I try to turn around and then be a bridge to my fire and EMS folks. Okay, this is the reason why police behave the way they behave, and a large part of it has to do with our training and an understanding of that. There, a lot of times. Um, uh, you know, folks don't understand why police behave the way they behave. Well, it really roots into our, our training and our responsibilities to a particular event. And generally speaking, this is a fairly new environment. Um, it's, it's crossing a lot of boundaries. I see a lot of good synergy. I see that this is the way that we are going to operate within the 21st century. Um, there is a military background uh, to the rescue task force concept, so I think it's already been vetted. It's just a matter of, you know, um, teaching each other, you know, how to, okay, what my roles are on scene, what your roles are, how we can cooperatively work together. Um, I'm fortunate that a lot of the law enforcement officers in rural areas wear two and three hats. They're firefighters, they're EMS folks, so that does help out quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure if that happens as much in the uh, urban or the city environments, but I know that in one case or another, we, we still get together, we still have coffee, we still talk, and I think that's going to be, uh, you know, the paradigm for our success. So I certainly hope I provided some valuable information, and uh, uh, I guess uh, we'll find out. Great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everything you did to prepare for today's webinar and also the initial webinar a couple weeks ago, Michael. Um, certainly a wealth of information, so thank you for that. And with that said, um, this concludes today's webinar. If you have any questions, uh, Michael's contact information is on the screen where you could reach out to us at the Justice Clearinghouse and we'd be happy to put you in touch. Thank you again, everyone, and please